the presence of God is here, right? The presence of God is in this place. I mean, you know God is in a place where people are willing to you know, stand on the wall to just keep from the word of God. You know, it's different when you're at a club or a theater or something, you stand on the wall, but can we just give it up to those folks who are just standing? Praise God, man. They're just standing. They're standing. And it looks like the Red Sea from here has been parted. Sis just, well, where's Sis? She stretched out Moses' rod and the sea just, just parted. Listen, I just want to just let you all know that this is just amazing. It's blowing my mind uh, seeing just a group of young adults that are just on fire uh, for God. That is crazy. That is crazy. Uh, I want to acknowledge those who aren't young adults for letting this happen. Uh, I want to let you know that, that our church doesn't have this. The Seventh-day Adventist Church does not have this on a worldwide scale. Y'all have something special uh, going on here. And I, I can't wait to just, just announce what's happening back uh, in California. This does my soul some good. This does my soul some good. So, uh, Vlad, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, I don't know who will say anything, but just because we're from California, don't mean we celebrity. Y'all from Miami. Y'all kind of bougie out here, too, in Orlando. So let's not get that twisted. Uh, but no, man, I'm just, I'm just honored to be a part uh, of what's taking place here. Uh, just a great thing that's happening over on campus. Again, uh, let's keep this going. And because of that, I, I really want to transition just a little bit. We talked about uh, God knowing us and completely loving us last night. And I just want to challenge us just a little bit in a different way this morning. Uh, we are tweeting, so don't put away your phones. We're not afraid for you to have your phone out. Um, we want you to use the hashtag. It should be on there. He loves me still, UCF. He loves me still, uh, UCF. That's the one we want you to use. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Pastor Kelly. And we just want you to just get the word out. Whatever's coming to your mind uh, from the word, uh, just tweet that out. If you got some questions, uh, we're going to deal with those later on tonight. But y'all ready to get busy? Yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's go to the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to actually start at verse 5. Acts chapter 17 and verse 5. Y'all can continue playing. The band is just amazing. Y'all are just doing your thing up here. Appreciate that. Uh, Acts 17 and verse 5. Were you happy? Can you say, I got it? All right, here's what the Bible says. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities. And here's the key. Here's what they were shouting. These men who have upset the world have come here also. I want to read that again. These men who have upset the world have come here also. If your prayers to God tell I'm going to preach under the subject, I knew you were trouble when you walked in. I knew you were trouble when you walked in. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, not another second or an hour nor another day. But at this moment, with my arms outstretched, I need you to make a way as you have done so many times before. And God, you've done it through a window or an open door. Father, here I am. I stretch my hands to thee. And I pray that you would come rescue me because I need you right away. Now, Spirit of the living God, keep falling on us. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. All God's children say amen. amen. And amen. Now, I'm going to ask a question. I know that all of us maybe have gotten to this point yet in our experience in life. But how many of y'all have ever been, like, in love before? There's a few of us. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's what's up. Thank you, everybody else, for being honest, because the kind of love I'm talking about, I mean, have you ever had, like, your nose wide open in love? I, I, I mean, like, like you're so open you can smell somebody's perfume down the street. I mean, the, the, the kind of love where, you know what I'm saying, you're, you're checking your phone every five minutes to see if they sent you a text, and if they haven't sent you a text, you're looking at Twitter, and if they haven't done anything on Twitter, you're looking at Instagram, and then you're so in love that you see that they posted on Instagram five minutes ago, and you're like, wait, if you can post on Instagram, bro, why don't you text me? Like, that's the kind of love I'm talking about, right? I mean, your nose is just, 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 just wide open. I, I mean, when their text shows up on the screen, you just stop for a moment and you just... 
The kind of love that maybe if you're married where you hear the garage door open, you're running downstairs because you can't wait to get that kiss that you've been longing for all day long. I'm talking about the kind of love that when you're in the middle of class or in work, you're sitting there pulling out your phone, just sending them little selfies of you. You know what I'm talking about? Like, this is my I'm thinking of you face, and this is my I want you face, and this is my where you've been at. I mean, that kind of love. And if you've ever been there before, you know that you go all out, right? For the person that you're in love with. I mean, you'll watch TV shows that, that you did not want to watch just to be with the person you wanted to watch. I mean, you're not into scandal, but, 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 but bro, you watching that thing. I mean, you can care less about Fitz and Olivia, but if your girl watches you, you're like into that thing, right? Maybe if you're a young lady, I mean, you, you, you you're not into Breaking Bad and all that different kind of stuff, but if your man likes that, when you're in love, you'll do stuff. Maybe if you're married, you'll do some crazy stuff. You'll take out the garbage. You'll get up a little early. You might even cook a meal knowing that you really can't cook. There's stuff that you will do, right? You'll make a fool of yourself for somebody that you're in love with. And each of us can understand that, and each of us maybe can relate in some way. And, and if you and if you haven't been there, because only a few of you have raised your hand, just I, I can't wait till you get to that place where you are in love with somebody so much so to the point that they literally change your life. They are ready to your character begins to act different. You show up to Sabbath school and and you'll come to any why? Why? Because you do all kinds of things for the person you're in love with. Isn't that true? And the bottom line is that if we can do this for all kinds of different people, my question that I have for us is what more can we do for God, right? I mean, we should be able to go all out for God. And when I look throughout the scriptures, I find a bunch of people who are in love with Jesus. I mean, they're so in love with Jesus that they don't just go all out for him, but they're willing to put their lives at risk for him. And as we look at this particular text in Acts, what we discover is some individuals are so in love with Jesus that here's what they do. They go around causing trouble for Jesus. Because here's what I found about individuals who are in love with Jesus when they go out into the world. Individuals like us who are followers of Christ, wherever we go, we cause trouble. And somebody said, what do you mean we cause trouble? Because I want to tell you something, that the love of Christ is a troubling thing. Because you see, what Christ's love does is it takes you and it shows you who you are and then it begins to change you from the inside out. And here's what I found, not everybody likes to be changed. A lot of people like to stay where they are, but what we do when we're in love with somebody is we'll go all out for that person, even if it means causing trouble for them. And so when I'm looking at this group of individuals here, it's one thing to cause trouble on a Saturday afternoon by ourselves, but what I'm seeing here is not just a church, I'm seeing a movement. I'm seeing people who are going to take Orlando by storm, but what I want to let you know that if we're going to cause trouble, and we will do that because we're in love with Jesus, there are certain characteristics of causing trouble that we need, and I want to spend some time going in through these characteristics of what we need in order to cause trouble as a result of being in love with Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing that we have to have in our psyche is we can't be satisfied. We can't be what, everybody? We can't be satisfied. Let me help y'all out a little bit with that. Uh, one of the cartoons I used to watch growing up was Popeye the Sailor Man. Anybody know Popeye? Yeah, Popeye was tight. He's like, you know, the brothers today. Remember, he had those big old arms with like skinny legs, you know? You know, the brothers being in the gym got big old arms and then you just kick him in the leg and they fall all over to the place. Because they need to do some squats, bro. Uh, and then remember, he had that girlfriend, Olive Oil, right? And Olive Oil was crazy. She had like one hairstyle, put her hair in a bun the whole time. Never changing, and she was just like this this stick figure, and and she couldn't wear no apple bottom jeans or, or or anything like that. But Olive Oil understood something. If all you are is a body, you really ain't nobody, right? Somebody caught that. Uh, but this one particular episode, uh, Bluto kidnapped uh, uh, Popeye's girlfriend and Olive Oil, and, and, and he tied her up. You know, he, a little freak or something like that. But you know, he, he ties her up, and Popeye's like, Nah, you you're not gonna do that. And so, you know, Popeye's, you, you, you can't mess with my girl. So Poppy goes over, and, and he's about to get Bluto. But Bluto just jumps out of nowhere and just starts beating Popeye down. And it's one thing to get beat up, right? But in front of your girl, that's a completely different story. Has that ever happened to anybody before? 
So what's that? No. I see your girl that's baby, it's okay. You came to my rescue. You were trying. So, 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 so Pluto is just like beating down Popeye and, 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 and knocking him to the place, and, and he's on the floor, and Olive Oil's like, and, and, and then you think Pluto, he's just clowning, and you think that would be enough, but, but, but that's not it. Here's what he starts to do. He starts to jump on Popeye. <sighs> he's looking at Olive Oil, just jumping on Popeye. Boom, boom. But let me tell you, that was the biggest mistake he could have made in his life. Because inside of Popeye's shirt was some spinach. <laughs> and what started to happen is the more he started to jump on Popeye, the more he pushed the spinach out of Popeye's shirt. And so he jumps on Popeye, the spinach flies out of Popeye's shirt, and he opens up his mouth, and he swallows the spinach, and he does that little laugh. <laughs> and then he looks at Bluto, and he says these words. He says, I've had all I can stand. And I can't stand no more. And he begins to beat that brother down yep, in front of his girl. And I want to tell you to everybody here at Message of Hope, here is what God is waiting for. He's waiting for us to get to the point where we look at our community, where we look at what's happening in the world, and we declare, I've had all I can stand. And I can't stand no more. No more racism. No more sexism. No more rape. No more adultery. No more murder. No more lying. No more lackadaisical Christian. Christianity. We've got to get to the point where we look at the world and see people that aren't in love with Jesus. That ought to bother us. That ought to get us to the point where we want to cause some trouble. But until we get to that place where we are just absolutely dissatisfied with what we see, we will just be satisfied with good church. Are y'all following me? See, all this is cool, and I'm just going to come hard because y'all got too much to go easy on. Y'all have got too much going on to be able to do that. But the fact of the matter is that if we are cool with everything, we'll never be moved. As a matter of fact, God can't do anything in your life until you look in the mirror and are not satisfied with what's looking back. So you've got to look at yourself and say, you know what, my character's not where it needs to be. I can be more educated. I can be more diligent. I can have more integrity. And when you get to that point where you're like, you know what, nope, that's not enough. Nope, I need to go higher. It's then that God moves in and says, now watch, let me take you there. So the first thing we got to do if we want to cause trouble as a result of being in love with Christ, we've got to get to the point where we're not satisfied with what we see. If that makes sense for you, say Amen. The second thing that I find that is in all of these individuals that have fallen in love with Christ and understand the love of Christ is that they are full of the Spirit. What are they full of, everybody? Spirit. They're full of the Spirit. Now, the Hebrew word for full is broken down into two ways. The first one is to be filled. It gives a picture of a cup, rather, that is filled to the brim, to capacity. Now, I'll never forget, I attended Columbia Union College. No, I didn't go to Oakwood, but for two weeks... And it's all right. There's such thing as black pastors who didn't go to Oakwood. Um, <laughs> there is, and I love Oakwood. You know, I love it. I just didn't go. But, 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 but I remember. I went to Columbia Union College, now Washington Avenue University, and I was uh, dating this young lady uh, my freshman year. I was 17, she was 21. I was uh, a, a freshman, she was a junior. Uh, if you put that equation equation together, that equals game. I understand. That's how that works. Right? <laughs> So, I mean, I have no car. I have no way to, to drive around this 21-year-old lady. And so, but, but thank God that D.C. is a place where, you know, there's all kinds of public transportation. And so, you know, I said, baby, we're we, we going to do it up today. I said, you know, I, I don't want you to be afraid that, you know, this young guy can't take care of you. I said, baby, so what we're going to do is I said, I got some all-day bus packs. Not one day, all-day bus packs, right? So that means wherever you want to go. I said, baby, this thing is so cool, now that one of us have to drive, right? I said, somebody's driving with us. And I said, here's what we're going to do. I said, I'm going to take you also. I said, we got this date planned. I'm going to take you to this restaurant, baby, and they make the food in front of us. It's going to be real cool. It's going to be real, real romantic and everything like that. And so when we pulled up to Subway. <laughs> see, I'm telling you, Vladimir, yo, Orlando was bougie because... Can you see the food being made in front of you in Subway? Yes. I see it right there. Lettuce, tomatoes, and pickles, and 
and spinach. And, and I told him, I said, baby, we doing it up. I said, you can get chips and a drink. We doing it up. Like, it's going to be tight. And, 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 and so that wasn't the day. There was no $5 foot long back in that time. This was a serious meal. And so, you know, she was a vegetarian, so it was going to be a little cheaper even itself. So, you know, she was watching her pickles get on there and, 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 and making her sandwich, and, and it was all good. And I, I'm, I'm proud of myself. So she goes back to the seat, and I go ahead and get our drinks. And I'm like, you know, God, baby, this is it, right? And I start filling up the cups, and I'm looking back at her flirting a little bit, filling up the cups. And I didn't notice that the cups got, you know, to that place where they're too full, right? And so when you walk back with full cups, you know, you got to go slow. You can't run back. You're going slow. You're looking at it because you don't want them to spill. But now I didn't notice that somebody had walked right in front of me. And what happened is they bumped into me and they spilled uh, my drinks in a place that, you know, you don't want that, you know, to spill. And I had khakis on, so it was really, you know, jeans can blend in. Uh, but the khakis is like... <laughs> And, and so, the, the, you know, it, it's all over there. And I, I was like, okay, the, the, those are my clothes. I felt bad. But here's where I felt the worst. Uh, he bumped into me, and it wasn't his cup, right? It was stuff that I put in my cup. But because he bumped into me, what was in my cup actually spilled over on him. Are y'all following that? What was in my cup spilled over on him. And let me tell you something about us as a group of young people in love with Christ, that we have to be careful with what we're filled with because whoever we bump into, what's in us will inevitably spill out over onto them. And part of the issue that I found with the church of God, and yes, it's going to be a little challenging, but here's the problem, that some of us are filled with the wrong stuff so that when people bump into us, we spill over onto them the wrong things. And we call ourselves followers of God and we say that we're in love with God and that he loves us still. But yet the stuff that comes out of us is not conducive to the stuff that we talk, that we sing about, that we preach about, that we worship about. And what starts to happen is people say, now wait a second, if that's who your God is, then why is that coming out of you? And so the problem with people joining the church and wanting to be a part of the church I apologize. We've actually tricked you. It's not because of Saturday. Because as a matter of fact, statistics say that the time most people who don't normally go to church and want to go to church is 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. It's not our religious beliefs or the things that we teach or that we say. That's not the reason that people don't want to come to church. But in the book on Christian, a 12-year study, they made it very clear that one of the top reasons individuals don't like the church is they don't see a difference between those who spend time in the church and those who are out of it. And so they say, well, I'm not going to waste three or four hours out of my day to come out looking just the same. That's why I tell people in my church all the time sometimes. I'll be like, hey, if y'all gonna act crazy, I said, tell people you go to Kansas Avenue. Don't tell people you go to Ruby. <laughs> because it's like, what we stand for, are y'all following me? Is not what you all are portraying at this moment. And so here's the challenge that we have to be careful. Sometimes God won't allow us to bump into people because he's afraid we're gonna stain their clothes. And so what we've got to make sure is that what is in is the right stuff because what's in is going to come out. And that's why what I love about these individuals in the Bible, Jason, and you could go through Joshua and all those individuals. When people bumped into them, the love of Christ came pouring out. And when the love of Christ came pouring out, it did something to their lives. It did them to their lives. And so what I want to challenge us is be careful with what you're filled with. Because what you're filled with comes out. If that makes sense for you, say amen. amen. Now, the second definition for this word uh, fill, for this Hebrew word fill, actually means to be so full that there's no room for anything else. Now, in my spare time, a um, couple things I do. One of them is I get down on you know my Xbox, PlayStation 4, and, and I play all different kinds of games. You know, Madden, all that different kind of stuff. That's what I do. Infinity with my girls, uh, the Avengers version just came out. We just get down on our games. And, and, and they have, yes sir, yes sir, that's right. And, and, and one of the things that they have is these role-playing games. And what it is is you can create your own character and you know, you make it look just like you and they don't have the light skin brothers down yet, but like, I ain't that bright, you know. 
I'm trying to get my eyebrows there. It's like it's either too thin or just way too thick. I'm like, come on, y'all, help, help us out. But, but what you do is you take this character and you go throughout the world, and what you do is you accumulate different items that help you beat the different uh, things in the game. And so you put things in what is called your backpack. And, and as you put items in your backpack, you use them on these different characters that you might have to come across. And so I'm going through it, and you know, you pay $59.99 for the game. It's usually got a good story. I'm going to beat this thing. I don't like to cheat. Don't tell me how it went. I'm not going to go online and look. But I got to this one part that I just couldn't not pass. I was just stuck. A week later, I'm still trying. I said, you know what? I'm going online. And so I look, going to YouTube, and they show me very clearly that in order to beat this individual, I had to get this particular item. And so what I do is they show me where the item is. I'm hyped, come home from church uh, during the week, and then I come here. Can everybody for you uh, right. This ain't a Bible game. Let's make that clear. It's in the Bible game. And so I come home and, and I get my stuff ready because I know where the thing is going to be. And then I go over the item. I find it. I'm excited. And I press the X button over the item. And it would not go in my backpack because there's an item that came over, a sign that came over my head that said inventory full. And so I was like, man, I clicked it again. It said inventory full. And then I recognized something that I had to do. In order to put that thing in, I had to go inside my backpack and I had to let some things go. But it was hard because everything in my backpack up to that point seemed important, it seemed valuable, it had gotten me this far, and I didn't know what to let go of, but something was very clear that if I wanted to beat the game, if I wanted to pass that level, I had to take something out so that I could put something else in. And I want to let you know something about us, that there are times in life where you're going to be rolling and things are going to be going great. And you're going to run up to something that you're not going to be able to handle. You're not going to be able to conquer. And God looks at us and he says, hey, 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 I got the thing you need. You're like, God, yes, can you give it to me? And he says, yes, I want to give it to you. And he tries to put it in and there's a sign that comes over our life that says inventory full. And so then God sits back and he waits and he says, all right, if y'all want to let this thing get in, he's all, you need to decide what you're going to let go of. But it's hard, right? Because everything that we have kept in our lives up to this point in our minds has gotten us this far. But here's what I want to challenge us to do. I want you to do an inventory of your life. And I want you to look and I want you to ask the question, what is it that's in me right now? that is preventing God from putting something else in me that's going to take my life to the next level? Is it a relationship? Is it somebody that you've been holding on to that you felt has been so good for you now, but now you recognize that if you continue to stay with that person, they're only holding you back? Is it maybe a habit that you've developed over the course of your life that God is like, you know what, I've got to let go of this habit because I've got something else that I need to put in. Let me tell you something about the game as I did a little reading up on it. The developers made it in such a way that no matter how many extra lives you had, no matter how many items you had, you cannot beat that part without that one thing. It just couldn't happen. And here's what I'm going to tell you. I know where you are. I know where you are. I don't know you, but I know where you are. There is something that you need right now to get you to that next phase in your life. Something that you need to take your marriage to the next place, to take your school to the next place, to take your spirituality to the next place. There's something that you need. And God is sitting back and he's dying to put it in you. But he's looking at our lives and he's saying, you know what? I want to put it in, but there's no room. And so he asks us, and he waits, and he says, let it go. And, here, and here's what we do. We pray, we complain, we get upset, and God is like, I get it. It's frustrating. It was frustrating. I couldn't beat the game. I was upset. I was bothered, but I needed something. But in order to get it, I had to let it go. What is it, message of hope? What is it? What is it that you've been holding on to, that you've got that emotional connection to, that seems like it's good, but it's not going to take you where God wants you to go? Now, I love this idea of being full because the reverse of that illustration also works. Wouldn't it be so awesome to be so full of the love and spirit of God that when the devil tries to bring something to your life, that there's a sign that comes over your head, inventory full. 
And the devil's like, man, I'm trying to get lust in there, but there's no room for it. I'm trying to get foolishness in there, but there's just too much Jesus. And eventually the devil says, you know what? They're just too full of the right stuff. We got to move on to somebody else. I wish we all could be that full. Now, let me tell you something about being full. This is just real talk. That's the only way I know to be. Real talk. Being full does not happen between Sunset Friday and Sunset Saturday. Being full does not happen because you preach a sermon or went to, uh, got your degree in theology. Being full does not mean that you sing in a praise team and that you participate in putting together an order of service. Being full means day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, you are asking God to fill you. It's not a once a week thing. It's not a how well I can dress up thing. It's not a how much I've eaten in the right stuff kind of thing. It's you saying, God, Put yourself in me. Amen. And here's what we've got to do. Here's what we've got to do. We've got to check constantly how full we are. We've got to check how connected we really are. Let me tell you one thing I, I, I admit. Um, this thing is the devil sometimes, man. You know what I'm telling you? I, I, I am, I, my phone, have you seen this little case around here? It's not just a case. This is a battery pack. It, this ain't really to protect my phone. It's because I go through two full charges in a day. That's how much I be getting stuff done. So I need my phone, right? And so by the end of the night, I, when I get ready to go to bed, sometimes I'm sitting on 4%. And let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff you can do with 4%. You got to shut down all your applications. <laughs> you can send out about four or five texts, but you have to dim the lights. <laughs> Don't check your voicemail. It sucks it right away, right? Can't make a long phone phone call. No long phone calls. Definitely no FaceTime. You try FaceTime, it boop. It's fun. So there's things I know to do at four percent. So here's what I did before I go to bed, right? We're talking about you know being full and checking your connection. So I plug my phone in and, and, and I put it in the wall and excuse me, you hear that thing beep and it lets you know that it's charging and I see that and I go to bed. And I'm like, Shh, I'm good at this one. I'm gonna wake up in the morning. I'm gonna have both. My battery and my phone completely fully charged. And so I woke up in the morning. And I have a busy day. I have emails on this thing. You know, I do all kinds of stuff, texts, phone calls. And I wake up and my phone is not at 100%. It's at 2%. And I'm like, are you serious right now? Like, I'm having a heart attack. So I'm like, what am I going to do? Yeah, I can get it and drive around the car. But, you know, I'm making calls and doing that kind of stuff in the car. And so I looked at the watch. There's something wrong with it. And during the middle of the night, you know, my, my, my charger just slipped out of the wall just a little bit. And, and so here's the thing. I didn't check my connection. I just assumed that because I plugged it in one time that it was going to be connected and charge up my phone. But when I woke up, because I didn't check my connection, I found that I had 2% phone. But here's my problem. I had 2% phone, but I had 100% problems throughout the day. Are y'all following me? See, I had emails. I couldn't get my emails out at 2%. I had stuff I had to do. But because I didn't check my connection, my phone was about to die. And here's what some of us do. We plug ourselves in one time, and we don't check the connection, and then we go throughout life at 2% and God's like, hey, you got 2% connection, but a 75% devil, and your 2% ain't going to deal with his 75%. And that's why being full and being connected becomes so important because we need to be at a full charge at all times. Why? Because the devil is serious when he sees us get serious. And that's why God made it clear to some. He said, why can't we cast out this demon? Because some of these things only come out through prayer and fasting. I challenge you, check your connection to make sure that you're full. Don't leave this place saying, oh, plugged in, I'm good. No, nope. because every now and then, your connection slips a little bit. If I woke up in the middle of the night just to go to the bathroom, I would have seen it. So this idea that of us changing the world, number one, we can't be satisfied. Number two, we have to be full. I'm looking at my time. Y'all hungry? Can, can, can somebody give me five more minutes? Who can give me five more minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, we're good. Um, here's, a, here's a second part of this idea that you find these people who have turned the world upside down and who have caused trouble. Uh, the Bible also says that they have what is called the spirit of wisdom. What do they have, everybody? 
the spirit of wisdom and the full spirit of wisdom. And I'm just going to say something about us. No, I didn't say you. I'm going to say something about us. We're dumb sometimes, aren't we? Yeah, we're, 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 we're real dumb. As a matter of fact, wisdom in the Bible actually can be defined in this way. Learning from somebody else's mistakes. That's wisdom. See, God doesn't want you to make the same mistake that somebody else has already made. That's why the Bible's trifling. No, no, I'm serious. The Bible doesn't paint people in a perfect picture. Did you know that? That's why I trip out when people are like, oh man, the Bible's boring. I said, are y'all crazy? I said, first and second kings is Game of Thrones. <laughs> no, no, I said, I said scandal, I said, David. <laughs> Come on. I mean, it's what it is. Oh, I want some, I want some action. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, the Bible is full of that stuff. And here's what it shows. It shows people, it shows what happens when they sleep with people they shouldn't sleep with. It shows what happens when they marry folk they shouldn't marry, right? I mean, the Bible lets us learn from other people's mistakes. But what we do is we make the same mistake, like, like for real. Here, here's what we do. We're just, we're crazy. Like, you saw him get her pregnant and not pay child support. But yet you're different. I'm going to change him. No, you're not. And all learn from her mistake. Right? I mean, brother, if you saw the fact that after every guy that she was with, he ends up less financially off than he was before, you're not going to be different because you have more money. Learn from other people's mistakes. And that's why I always tell uh, some of the adults around to not be afraid to share what your mistakes are, but uh, you know, let them know that yes, y'all listen to different music. It wasn't the stuff we listened to, but it was the same kind of thing with Marvin Gaye and all these different kinds of folk. But sometimes the older folk, don't they walk around? I'm not trying to be mean, because I'm old now myself, but we say stuff like the things I used to do. I don't do anymore, and the places I used to go, I, I don't go anymore. And you're right, because the places you used to go are closed now, right? <laughs> it's like, they're not open anymore. And the things you used to do, you're too old, you have no energy, right? It's like, oh, you're a person. But wisdom is learning from somebody else's mistakes learning from somebody else's mistakes. But there's this other idea, there's two other ways that they look at wisdom in the Bible. And I just want to apply so these are the last two points and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. The first thing about wisdom is being skilled at war and being skilled at battle. And I started thinking about like, what does it have to do with turning the world upside down and causing trouble? But when I started to look at this idea of wisdom, it, it gives this idea of being trained. It gives this idea of being trained. Now one of the things that, that I do in my spare time is, is I spend some time uh, doing uh, Filipino martial arts. I do Filipino martial arts. Uh, that's kind of MMA with, with, with the weapons kind of thing. And one of my elders, uh, you know, was trained in that, and we started going. And so for the last about five years, I've just been, you know, training with him. You know, we offer a free class at the church for the community, uh, and we got people coming. It's, it's, it's really fun. You know, keeps you in shape, all that different kind of stuff. So I, I go uh, to train with my elder, and he says, you know, Pastor, he's a listen. I don't know how you feel about this. He said, oh, you've been training with me for a couple of years now. I said, yeah, yeah, I said, good time, appreciate it, man. You don't charge me, and I really appreciate that. He says, but man, we got to put these skills to use. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, man, I think you need to get the, I think you need to fight. We're going to sign you up for a fight. I said, really, you think I can? He said, yeah, you know, you might have been nervous about yourself, but when somebody who's better than you thinks you can do it, you're like, yeah. <laughs> do that. And so, you know, I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Sign up for a fight. So I got the date where I was going to go my fight. And I added an extra trainer, somebody else who trained under him. And I had Ron Goldsman was my first trainer. And then I got with my boy Shannon uh, uh, McKenzie. And, and so we're training. I'm telling you, out, outside of Saturdays, I'm in the gym two hours every single day getting ready for my fight. Just getting ready for my fight. And I remember when I stepped inside, my, my trainer looked at me and he said, uh, dude, I'll let you know you're not Pastor Kelly when you walk inside of here. He's, I have, he goes to my church. He's, I have no qualms doing what I need to do to you. And I said, that's no problem, man. I got the Holy Ghost, man. So let's do it. Right? Let's go. And, and, and so, you know, we do it. And my trainer was, I mean, he, he, he would go in. He would go in. And, and my members knew about it. You know, they knew it was coming up. And I come up sometimes in a pulpit like this. 
you know, uh, the, the, just the, the day right before, had a little black eye, all that kind of stuff, because he's going, because he's like, dude, I'm getting you ready for the fight. So I gotta train you, man, I gotta get you ready. So the day of my fight shows up, it was last year in September, and, and so we show up uh, you know, to the place, and, and, it, and it hits you, right? Like, I'm about to fight. Like, and this dude doesn't, you know, he doesn't care, you know, whoever I'm, you know, I'm, I'm about to fight. And, and you know, you, you, everybody has a plan. Everybody talks what they don't do. You know, the brother, you know, some of the brothers do, yeah, man, he had come up to me. This is what I would have done. And then he comes up to you, and everybody has a plan till you get hit, right? <laughs> Everything you saw going completely different. And so, uh, the, 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 the guy comes in, and there's really no referees. He just simply says, tap in. And you're on. And 45 seconds later, the fight was over. <laughs> Just done. They didn't even get their money's worth, right? And Pastor Kelly stood victorious. Somebody else was saying, hey! He said, prayer works, right? And, 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 and the brother tapped out with, with, for, for 45 seconds. And so they, they came to me afterwards. And like I said, my members had driven down to LA to see my elders were there. They were probably, you know, like I said, you know, lifting hands and, and doing what they needed to do. But, but, but they asked me. I actually had two fights that day and ended up winning both. And, and so afterwards, my trainer came to me and he said, Hey, man, he said, Do you remember anything that you did? I said, No. It was just a blow, a blur. I said, yeah, my adrenaline was going, and, and we're doing a thing. And I love what he said. He said, man, he said, everything you did is everything that we train for. He said, you don't remember that? I said, no. He says, here's why. He said, we trained so much that this stuff just started coming out naturally. He said, and so even though you didn't know what he was going to do, it didn't matter what he was going to do because you were trained so much in what you were supposed to do. And so the thought hit me very clearly that because I put so much time in training, when the fight came up, I was ready for the fight. And I want to let y'all know something that right now that we are in a battle. We are in a war. But here's the difference with our battle. I knew the date of my fight. You don't know the date when your fight is going to show up. And so here's what I want to challenge us to do. Can we just spend more time in training? Can we spend more time developing the skills so that when the devil shows up, that the things of God just naturally start to flow out of us? We've got to train hard. And let me tell you something about the hard training. The fight was over in 45 seconds because I trained extremely hard. Our fights last way too long. As a matter of fact, here's why these movies like The Exorcist don't bother me. They don't bother me because they're completely unrealistic. You say, oh, stay away. That's, oh, that, that's just too real. No, it's not. If Jesus was starring in the Exodus, excuse me, in the Exorcist, the movie would last about 45 seconds, come out of him, and then those credits would have started to roll. Jesus will take all that time, an hour and a half, an hour 45 minutes, to cast out a demon. Why? Because Jesus is so trained that when he spoke, the demons had to come out. And we need to be so trained that the fights in our lives don't last too long because we speak with the authority of the God that we've been trained in. Oh, it's taking me so long to get over this. And oh, brother, so and so and I haven't gotten along in so in this long in years. And I've still got this problem four years later. That's because we ain't trained, y'all. Our fight shouldn't last long. We should have the devil tapping out as soon as he steps on our playing field because we're that trained. We got to train, y'all. Train hard, y'all. I train two hours every day for, uh, for two fights. For two fights that lasted a total of two minutes and 45 seconds. That's how long my fights did last that's how we have to train. I don't know when your fight's going to be, but I, here's what my challenge is and my prayer is for you. That when it shows up, that you whoop the devil's behind just like that. Whether he takes the form or shape of a person or anything, our fights should not last that long. I challenge you to train, to read this thing, to be in this thing and allow it to be in you and it will naturally come out of you. That makes sense when you say amen. All right, now here's my last thing about this idea of wisdom. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Keep playing, keep playing. Here's my last thing of wisdom. It gives this idea of being skilled in administration. I'm like, what does that have to do with being able to turn over you? Is the Bible talking about being good businessmen or something like that? But I started looking at this idea 
of, 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 of business and administration. And a lot of businesses, if we were to take uh, McDonald's versus uh, Burger King, McDonald's versus Burger King, they both make burgers, right? And what they each try and do is make a, a better burger than the other. And, and, and so, you know, Burger King will come out with charbroiled, and, and McDonald's will come out uh, with, with, with a different chicken kind of sandwich. And then Burger King, I remember they insulted our intelligence. They said, and we got this new burger with fries in it. It's like, we did that. <laughs> we took our fries and put it in there. Y'all trying to charge us? Nah. I mean, like, <laughs> so they're coming out with all these different kinds of, you know, burgers and stuff like that, and they're trying to be better than one another. And so you finally, you see Burger King and McDonald's always doing this, maybe in stocks, and as far as the two restaurants are concerned. Uh, but, but, but there's a person by the name, he, he was living uh, not too long ago, Steve Jobs. You all remember Steve. He, I mean, this dude changed the game, right? Because Steve Jobs says, I'm not going to try to be better. I'm going to try and be different. That's just how I'm going to I'm going to be different. And so what Steve Jobs did is when the flip phone was out, he didn't say, I'm going to make a better flip phone. He said, I'm going to make a different phone. It's going to be a smartphone. It's going to be completely different than the one that you've seen. And then when those little PDA pads, people used to have a little stylus, and they pull it out to keep your calendar, and that was cool. He said, you know, I ain't going to come out with no, with, with no better PDA system. No, no, no. I'm going to come out with an iPad. And that's going to eliminate even PDAs. And so what Steve Jobs did is he said, you know what? I'm going to be different, and I'm going to be so different that my difference is actually going to make a difference. Now, I'm going to say something about us as seven-day Adventist Christians, and maybe not all of us fall under that category, but I want to say this. We're different, ain't we? Are we different? I mean, we, man, we got, we got different food even. Hey, stacks. <laughs> I mean, it's different. You ask people, you're like, people ask you, what's a haystack? And you're like, beans and lettuce and, and, and chips stacked together. It's a haystack, right? I mean, we're, we're different. I mean, y'all, we are so different. We don't go to the movies. We just have Netflix. We're different. I mean, we, we don't wear jewelry in our ears, but we'll put it on our clothes and stuff because it's different if it goes on your on your clothes, but if it's around your neck or some no, no, no. That's it. I mean, y'all, we are different. I want to tell you something. Is our difference making a difference? Because if your difference doesn't make a difference, you're just weird. <laughs> And here's what I'm afraid of. I think the Christian Seventh-day Adventist Church, we've turned into a bunch of weirdos because our difference hasn't made a difference. Why? We got the health message, but we still out of shape. Don't eat meat, but still can't run a mile. Come on, somebody. I mean, we go to church on a different day. Who cares? What difference does it make? Because God's whole thing is, I haven't come down here, died, filled you with my spirit just to be different. I want your difference to make a difference. And I'm looking at a group right now that is absolutely different. Now here's my challenge. Do something crazy. Do something that people don't usually think about. Make a difference. Make a difference. Don't be satisfied with what you have here. Cause trouble and make a difference. Cause trouble at UCF campus. Cause trouble at your school. Cause trouble at your job. Cause trouble in your family. Not an arrogant trouble where you're going in beating people with the Bible, but trouble that says, look at what Jesus has done for me, and I'm going to show you what he can do for you. I beg you, you all have got something amazing and incredible. Don't be weird. Be different and allow it to make a difference. I want to tell you this last story that we're going to, that we're going to close. There was a, a husband, his wife, and their son, and they were going to have a contest about who could catch the most fish. And so they decide to go fishing, and here's how the rules would go. Whoever caught the least amount of fish had to end up cooking that particular night. And so Mama decides that she's going to go down to one particular part of the river and, and get some fish. And, and, and the father and son say, well, Mama don't know what she's talking about. The fish are going to be down here. And so they're down there, and, and they don't catch anything for a while, but they hear Mama just talking trash down the way. Ha-ha! 
Y'all better get that ready, boy. We got some tilapia, salmon, all kinds of stuff. She's pulling in all kinds of fish. And they're like, man. They start to catch a few, and they don't hear their mother talking as much trash. And so they say to themselves, we're catching up. We're catching up. And so they look down to start saying something to mama. And they realize that she's not on the side of the river anymore. She's in the river. And mama can't swim, and so she's drowning. The sun runs off and dies inside of the river to try and save his mother. If some of you have ever lifeguarded before, you know what it's like when you're trying to save somebody who's drowning. You put your arms around them and they're just fighting and, and, and knocking things away. So he puts his arms around his mother, but she knocks his arms away. He tries again, puts his arm around her, but she just knocks his arms away until finally he gets a good grip on her and he pulls her to safety and puts her on the side of the river and begins to do CPR, uh, two breaths and 15 chest compressions, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, goes through it, breathe, breathe, and he goes through the process over and over, five minutes passes, 10 minutes passes, 15 minutes passes, and it comes to the realization that mama is caught. The father turns away as he can't bear to see the sight. And the son, on his knees, hovering over his mom, trying to put every bit of breath that, of life that he has into her, realizing that it's too late, stands up and looks to the heavens and cries out a shriek that was heard throughout the entire town as he says these words, Mama! Mama! I tried to save you. But you just kept on fighting. He said, I have my arms around you, mama, but you kept knocking them away. If you would just let me save you, mama, you'd be alive today. And the question I have for each of us is, will there come a time where Jesus looks down from heaven and says, I tried to save you, but you just kept on fighting? I said, weeks of prayers and pastors and elders and parents to, to teach you my word to give you and every time it came around you you just knocked your arms away Jesus declaring maybe I tried to save you but you just kept on fighting and so today there's somebody who maybe is sinking in something Jesus has jumped in the water with you and your stuff is dirty I get it but he doesn't mind getting dirty for us and Jesus is in right now. And right now, this moment, you feel his arms around you. I don't want you to knock them away. I want you to just let go and let him pull you to safety. So if there's somebody here under the sound of my voice, and I want to ask that you pray because it could be the person next to you, in front of you, or behind you. But if there's somebody here today that needs to stop fighting and give themselves over to Jesus, I want you to slip out of your seat. I want you to come down here to the front. Not because you want to make me feel better because it's time to stretch or go. But no, you are like, man, I am sinking in this stuff. And I am ready at this moment right now to just say, God, just take it. Just take it. Take me. Take me the way I am. And so they're going to sing this song. I give myself away. So if there's somebody, there's somebody who needs to move. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And there's somebody else who's like, and this is not for special prayer. This is a special prayer. Don't move for that. We're, we're, we're always praying for you. This is for somebody who's like, you know what? I need God to come and take me. And I need to connect with him in a very intentional way. I want to study. I want to get some studies to get deeper with Christ. Maybe you know that these studies might lead to a baptism. And that's that. That's this appeal this morning. For the rest of us who, who just need special prayer, we're going to pray for you. We don't want to ignore that, but this is very specific now. There's somebody who has not given this thing to God. You haven't done it. Or you did it a while ago and you need to do it now. You straight away. I just want you to give yourself away to him. If you're in overflow, I want you to come. Pray, I know. 
know, I know it's like, oh man, we gotta hurry up, we gotta hurry up, but somebody right now, this is life and death for them right now. Don't worry about what you've done, what kind of stuff you got going on. Everybody looks ugly when they drown. Everybody's got mess when they drown. Let them just stay alone. trouble that's not superficial, trouble that's not pharisaical, but trouble that says we're going to upset the status quo because the God who loves us has something greater for us. And so God, we're not satisfied with what we see. We're going to be filled with your spirit. We're going to be wise and learn from other people's mistakes. We're going to train up in war. And then Father, finally, our difference will make a difference. And when that takes place and the love of Christ just flows through us and out of us, we believe that we'll make a difference in our community. Father, I pray for these individuals who will come, who have admitted, who have just said, hey, I need God. And God, thank you for them not concerning themselves with what other people may think. Because God, it doesn't matter what others think as much as it does what you think. And so, God, I pray that you would take them and that whatever it is that they are needing, that they are lacking in their lives now, that you would supply whatever decisions need to be made now would be solidified, that you, that, that you would uh, help us, the team here, to be responsible, to connect them with the right people so that they can facilitate a, a, a relationship with you and they'll grow with you, God. Then finally, Father, I want to pray for just this movement. I'm not going to call this thing a church. This movement that is taking place here. The devil is so angry and is strategically planning for every soul that would dare contribute to what's happening here. God, I pray that you would thwart his plans. But I don't just pray that you would thwart them. I pray that you would use us to do it. God, we've got to step our game all the way up. We've got to support this church financially. We gotta support this movement financially. Now I know it doesn't seem we may have a lot. We're in school, God, but little becomes much in the hands of the master. God, we gotta support this place with our time, and it doesn't seem like we have enough. But God, thank God you had time to come and die for us. So God, I just pray our time, our talent, and our treasure that we would please contribute to this movement right here. God, you're coming soon, and I'm so excited to see. That there's a group that believes that still today. So Father, help us to stretch ourselves for you. And then when you come again, may everyone who's under the sound of my voice look to the sky and be able to say, Lord, this is our God. We've waited for him and he has come to save us. So God, we acknowledge you today. We love you today. And we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, let all God's children say amen and amen.